What? Fucked my home state. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 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 uh. You caught me on Texas, that one, bro. That I wasn't is. ready yeah. for that. This is Behind the Bastards podcast. Bad people tell you all about them. We have a, an opening schema that I used in the last episode that dates back several years where I would, I would essentially say what's Xing my Ys. It started with generic introduction, mm-hmm. you know, what's cracking yeah. my peppers and stuff. And now it's become uh, completely atomized from its origins and probably makes no sense to people who are just like hopping into an episode but that's how we yeah. introduce shows sometimes so yeah hello it's quite a joy man i'm not gonna lie we, and we don't usually introduce ourselves and sometimes we forget to introduce our guests yep our guest who is of course prop uh i will not be saying is your he? your your government name, government again. name. <laughs> mm-hmm. appreciate that mm-hmm. i mean it's but all uh, yeah <laughs> yeah um prop yeah. how do you feel about texas <sighs> Uh, how truthful do you want me to answer this? <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. Yeah. Nobody, I can't nobody, stand this place. Yeah. yeah uh, it's, I, I couldn't, I, you know, yes. now, there's things about it that are nice. Yeah. Now as a caveat, there are mm-hmm. plenty of lovely people that I yeah. adore that live in Texas. One of which is my grandmother, mm-hmm. you know, was from, uh, Sulphur Springs and moved to Dallas and my mm-hmm. father's born in the big d you know what i'm saying mm-hmm. and like so i got mm-hmm. some i got some some roots out there that being said i don't know nobody in my family that still lives there mm-hmm. because pretty much estranged from that side of the family that being said the ones that were from texas that i do know all came to california in the 60s so in my mm-hmm. mind they're californians mm-hmm. so yeah I, I mean i moved from texas to california it was one of the best decisions i ever made in my fucking I mean, life <laughs> just like my great grandma you know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there is a thing that you get. I mean, I, I, I say it's about half of the people that I love in the world still live in Texas. There's wonderful things about it. There's of stuff course. that only Texas has. But like there is a, a feeling a lot of people get living in Texas that more or less I would sum up as, whew, I got to get the fuck out of here. Yeah. <laughs> like I got to exactly. get the fuck out of this place. Uh, <laughs> DJ, yeah. I, one of my DJs is from San Angelo that I work yeah. with. And same thing. He was just like, I'm a Texan, but I cannot wait to leave. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it it, it is indelibly printed on my soul. There's all sorts of things about me that are very deeply Texan, but like, I just hit a point where I was like, I'm gone. Yeah, Yeah, Um, I gotta get out of here. And what else? Coffee is great. Yeah, Davis Green Espresso in Dallas. Marfa's a great thing. Um, I like I like a lot of West Texas. Um, Had some real good times in Hill Country. Um, Mm -hmm. There's kinds of freedom that you can have in Texas if you're a white person. I should I should stay. Now. Yeah, if you are a Time white out. person, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, that you you don't often find other parts of this country, even as a white person. There's like mm. things that you can get up to in Texas that are absolutely yeah. nuts. Um, but it comes with a couple of caveats. One of them being the fact that Texas has probably the most nightmarish juvenile justice system in the entire United States, which, oh, as man. we have discussed a number of times on this podcast, including earlier this week, has a pretty shitty history with juvenile yes. justice. Texas is unquestionably the worst, like the state that is the that has the, so the worst history with juvenile justice. And that's Texas is winning in a contest that includes fucking Florida. It's crazy. Like, fuck, yeah. do you know how much Florida hates kids? Yes. <laughs> Florida really, really <laughs> hates kids. <laughs> Texas. Woo boy. Yeah. That's what we're about to talk about today. Um, so in our last episode, I opened by giving a history of the term super predator. And while that mm-hmm. specific term was the creation of a single man, Man, he was simply the latest in a line of men who have spent generations building and reinforcing a narrative that some children are inherently dangerous and must yeah. be policed brutally for the safety of all. William S. Bush is a Ph.D. U.S. history professor from the University of Texas at Austin, and he's a good guy. I introduced oh, okay. him after talking about the super predator thing. No, he's, he's like, he he he's a he knows his shit. Uh, okay. He wrote a book that is one of the major sources for this episode with one of the most chilling titles for a book I've ever heard. It's called Who Gets a Childhood? And it is about the wow. criminal justice system in Texas. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, it's Bro, it is. that's interesting, dude, because it's like one of the the things among like black activism is the idea that like black and brown children are forced to be adults yeah. in the eyes of the law way before we're ready to be it. So, yeah. man, OK, this is crazy. Yeah. And boy, right. boy, he does focus. A lot of it is about racism in the Texas criminal yeah. justice or ch- juvenile justice system. Yeah. It's a good book. I recommend mm-hmm. it. It's very readable. It is kind of an academic text, but it's a very readable one. That's dope. Um, 
Now, Bush, and it folk, folk, it's, this is a book about Texas specifically. Mm-hmm. Bush notes that historians of childhood uh, claim that the, or tend to agree that the concept of, of what they call protected childhood started in the United States around the 1820s. Obviously, this is a thing happening in different parts of the world in different ways. But like yeah. we now see childhood as like you have to, not just that like you have to protect children, which is a thing people have always done, but you have to protect children from certain things like understanding and interacting in the world the same way an adult mm-hmm. does, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Kids don't work. They shouldn't. We most people agree on that now. Like, a, yeah. like the, kids should not Recently, labor yeah. like adults labor. Yeah. Kids should not be subject to some of the realities that adults are subject to. These are we can always debate some of this stuff, like particularly hiding certain realities of the world from kids. But these are things society yeah. broadly agrees upon now. This is what a yeah. protected childhood is, right? Yeah. The idea that you protect kids from some of the things that adults have to deal with and know. Yeah. The movement towards this concept of a protected child. Childhood in the United States, and again, we're talking in the U.S. here. It happens other places, different ways. There's a lot of academics here. Please, I'm not trying to. This is this is a broad overview. Yeah. This movement starts with the free school and Sunday school social movements, which again, kind of the 1820s come down. As we've talked about, actually, in a couple of recent episodes, these all start in like the Northeast and kind mm-hmm. of spread to the rest of the country. These ideas that like school should be free, every kid should get an education, and it shouldn't mm-hmm. cost them anything, and also the idea that like Sunday school is a is a thing. Thing, which is, yeah. you know, tied to religion, but also, also tied mm-hmm. to this idea that like this very new idea that like education is a thing that every kid deserves. Yeah. So people died all the time back then for basically no reason, which also meant that like in this period, there's a ton of orphans, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so when people started this kind of long process of giving a shit about childhoods for children, um, it leads to a bunch of facilities getting opened not just to deal with orphaned kids, but to deal with like kids who are delinquent, kids who have uh-huh. various kind of behavioral issues. They all kind of get shoved into the same place. These, these are generally called houses of refuge. Yeah. And it's a mix because obviously they are saying that like, well, if you're homeless or, or if you're a kid committing petty crimes, you belong in the same place, which is not great. Um, oh. Yeah. But also it is it is good in that it's kind of a, as a society, people being like, well, even though they're not my kid, I, as a member of society, have some responsibility towards them. Yeah, it's just to fund this facility, which is not a bad development. Again, it's no. problematic. But yeah, but it's a communal yeah. understanding that like the children are ours. Yeah, like yeah. not just yours; they're ours. And like we, and if we want to like live in a community that we enjoy, like yeah. I should invest in you know what yeah. I'm the other yeah. humans around me. You know what I'm saying? It, it, I yeah. think often it, when we talk about movements like this, it is easy to focus on like the horrible negatives, which we'll be talking about. Everything today we're mm-hmm. going to talk about comes from this, but it's all, it's not one thing or the other entirely. It is, no. there's a lot that's fucked up about this. It also is coming from this place of like, oh, there's all these children on the streets and like, maybe we have a responsibility <laughs> to them. We can probably do something we about live this. here too. Ba- yeah. Where your mama at? Yeah. Yeah. Where your, yeah. You, what are you doing out there? Where your people? <laughs> what, what you doing on the court? You're three years old. Why are you on the yeah. court? Yeah. Dude, yeah. I, I would even say this, man, like even just going through as a parent, like I'm saying yeah. this as like a now a parent is like even when going through just the history of the decisions other parents or societies have made for their kids that obviously that weren't preposterous, but mm-hmm. ones that are like. The reality is like, there's no, this a whole ass human. Yeah. And you're like, there's nothing more terrifying than the idea of like, their life is in my hands and I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. Like that, that existential dread, I feel like if you're going to be a good parent, you have felt that fear where you're like, I don't know what I'm doing. You know what I'm saying? And you're like, where do, what do I, I can't, Mm -hmm. I don't know what I'm, I don't know what I'm, I don't want to fuck this kid up. You know what I'm saying? And you know, you're like, well, I'm fucked up. You know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, I don't know. I just, I think like at the, you're like, I don't know what I'm doing, but at least I know you shouldn't live on the damn streets, man. Like there needs to be some sort of adult in your life. Right. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 And that that that's kind of happening on a really broad scale here. Yes. And a lot of it's made possible because of industrialization, but there's a lot more people from industrialization kind of totally. resources. And so like yeah. these facilities kind of grow in size and pop up, start popping up all over the United States throughout like kind yeah. of the mid to late 1800s. Now, 
At the same time all this is happening, and part of why it's happening, is that the U.S. is creating its middle class, um, and in fact, the very concept of a middle class. Parents start having fewer kids and devoting a lot more time and attention to the development of the kids that they do have. Mm -hmm. And the idea starts to spread as a result of all this that children not not don't, don't just deserve maybe to be housed, but deserve to learn and play um, and not to die in coal mines or like bang yeah. drums while sh adults shoot rifles at each other, Did, right? At that, like, some point. We maybe shouldn't be point. doing some of the things yeah. we're doing with kids. Yeah. At some point, you said to yourself, you know, my childhood was trash. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I didn't really get to that. Look, I wish I could have been able. You know what? When I have yeah. kids, I'm going to let them play outside. You don't need yeah. to go to no coal mine and die. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 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 And so that that's happening in this period. And the kind of the people who these early advocates of the concept of a childhood, these early like people who are, are supporting the idea that there should be restrictions on like what we can make kids do. Mm -hmm. um, they're generally called child savers. And most of them are middle class moms. Um, and it's from them and this advocacy in kind of the late 1800s that we get stuff like age of consent laws, child labor wow. bans and mm -hmm. compulsory education. Yeah. That's all good stuff, broadly speaking. Um, but these Positive moves occur along more muddled developments, too, because these women are also responsible. These activists are also responsible for the concept of youth curfews, the idea that, like, well, we shouldn't let kids out at night sometimes and they should be punished if they are out at night um, and Sheesh. the juvenile justice system, which is a very mixed bag. William go. Bush writes, many of these reforms were aimed at extending the protections of childhood to working class and poor children. Moreover, they sought to broaden the years of protection and semi-dependence on adults upward into the adolescent years, a reflection of the slowly spreading idea of adolescence itself at the turn of the 20th century. One of its mm -hmm. leading proponents, the Clark University psychiatrist and child study movement leader, Granville Stanley Hall, described the life stage of adolescence famously as a time of storm and stress, a time of risk-taking, rebellion, awkwardness, and self-discovery. Adolescents, he and other psychiatrists such as William Healy proposed, uh, po needed to be treated individually, especially when they ran afoul of rules, as seemed almost inevitable. Early juvenile court judges, such as Denver's Ben Lindsay, helped popularize the idea of the tough but fatherly juvenile justice official for whom understanding his wayward charges was a specialty. Meanwhile, courts for delinquent girls, headed by matronly figures such as Mary N. Barthelm of Chicago, preoccupied themselves with curbing the Cautious sexuality of working class girls, whose families were often recent arrivals in American industrial cities. So again, a lot going still, on here, you know? Yeah, still um, products of your your time. Of its time. But yeah, yeah. this is this is kind of how this starts to look. Um yeah, and it's uh, it's important to note that, like, because we're talking about how bad the juvenile justice system, the idea that we should have one came from a really good place, which is that like yeah. Kids should shouldn't be, be treated with, as adults when they commit yeah, crimes. Yeah, you shouldn't be in prison yeah. with grownups. Yeah. yeah, you shouldn't be in prison with grownups. You shouldn't be judged by the same judges who judge grownups. Like, we yeah. should have a separate thing for you, in mm -hmm. part because kids are going to fuck around. And, like, mm -hmm. they're like the finding out part of that shouldn't be as brutal as it is for adults. Yeah. Uh, judge Lindsay even complained, quote, the, This business of punishing infants as if they were adults and of maiming young lives by trying to make the gristle of their unformed characters carry the weight of our iron laws and heavy penalties penalties um yeah it's a so good he's, place yeah yeah there's there's yeah. some guy some people who are saying really good shit now in texas juvenile and adult offenders were first separated in 1886 after protests from the local women's christian temperance union which is right around the same time it starts happening in a bunch of other places the next year the legislature in texas passed a bill approving a dedicated house of correction for children gatesville opened in january of 1889 and it was one of the first dedicated juvenile detention facilities anywhere in the united States. It was followed later that year by facilities from in Virginia, Kentucky, and Alabama. Gatesville opened with 86 inmates. It was immediately popular with the locals, who saw rightly that it would bring a lot of jobs to their town. Local what? residents actually raised money so the state can't pay, like their budget runs short and they can't pay for all of the land they need to buy this facility. And people uh -huh. who live in the town nearby raise the money to buy it for the state because they're like, well, this is going to provide us with jobs forever if we have a child prison in town. Oh my God. Why is that their first thought was like, yeah, no, it's everybody's first thought when this yeah. shit happens. Yeah, I was like, Spoilers, what? that's where this is going for the yeah. next century. Uh, that's why I went, mm -hmm. what? It's like, mm -hmm. I thought they were going to be like, oh, that's cool, man. You know, yeah, kids ain't got to, shouldn't have to go to jail. No, there's like, money in like, this shit. Oh, wait, we can yeah. make some money off this mug. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yo, hit the lick, bro. Like, what? Yeah. 
Yeah, it's yeah. great. Um, so the boys who were interned in Gatesville were overwhelmingly city dwellers. And there's this idea at the time that Texas never gets past that kids who are juvenile delinquents, most of whom are urban kids, need to be put in prisons far away from their families in yeah. isolated rural communities. Um, basically, all of these kids were poor, too. One survey of early Gatesville inmates found that 119 out of 195 listed their mother's occupation as housekeeper, while the leading descriptions of their fathers were unknown, railroad men, laborers, and farmers. Unknown being up there is yeah. should tell you something about what's going yeah. on. Two thirds of these boys had lost one of their parents, and slightly less than half of their parents had criminal records themselves. William Bush goes on to note that the racial disparity in who went to Gatesville was pretty blatant. African Americans mm. comprised 46 of the first 40 of uh, the first 68 inmates, all of whom were transferred from the adult prison system. Although mm. Gatesville in admitted inmates regardless of race or ethnicity, it strictly segregated every aspect of their daily lives: housing, schooling, dining, and religious services. As a result, by 1917, about 250 black inmates crowded into Harris Hall, the Jim Crow congregate dormitory built to house about half that number. By contrast, when the state opened its first and only training school for girls before World War II, it excluded black females altogether. Black girls charged with committing a crime in this period may have had their cases heard in local juvenile courts, but the available remedies were limited to the county jail or released back into the community. There is so, nothing new. Yeah, yeah. I mean, oh my God, not exactly yeah. news that Texas in 1917 was right. pretty fucking racist. Um, right. But it's good to have data on I how also racist... Just yeah. yeah, like I'm still like trying to picture a juvenile hall in the 1800s. Oh God, right? Ooh, yeah, and I'm just like spiral. Like it just got me spiraling. I think like I just don't know how anyone survived the 1800s. Yeah, and one of the worst things to think about is the degree to which maybe it's it wasn't much worse than it is now. At least in yeah. a lot of these facilities in Texas. Yeah, um, yeah. but that's a. That's something we'll, we can talk about. So the fact that Texas would go on to lead the nation in juvenile incarceration had a lot to do with the fact that Texas was the only southern state to see a net gain in its black population during the first half of the 20th century, right? Yep. That's part of why they're building these facilities is they yep. have this huge influx of black um, and Hispanic uh, citizens moving to the state. Um, and well, so you've got... Hmm. Well, the Hispanics were already there. But. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yes, but yeah, but yeah, no. I mean, you like, do have more like coming in from Mexico and true. stuff, and you also have, um, you have a huge number of poor non-white kids moving into Texas cities, mm -hmm. um, a lot of whom don't have parents. Um, for a, a variety of horrible reasons. Um, and this causes a backlash from white Jim Crow supporting citizens who don't like seeing all of these kids who are not white in the, what they think of as their cities. Yeah. Uh, police do the thing that police do, which is responds to the demands of middle class yeah. white people. And they start sweeping juke joints, uh, which is generally how the places they sweep to, to arrest black kids are described. I think it's like, you know, it's like a, a, a dance hall. They yeah. I was like, that's just it, like the you know? club, a juke yeah, is like, like the, yeah, the, the juke what got at the time. The juke joint. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a lot of great music came out of there. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, the nation's first juvenile court was was established in Chicago, and the focus of this court was, at least on paper, supposed to be rehabilitating the kids that got interned in the system. Texas, though, and obviously Chicago, like that system, you know, a yeah. lot of flaws in it, a lot of things that they could be criticized, could probably do an episode about that. But it's worth noting that the first juvenile court in the nation is in Chicago, and it's supposed to be uh, focused on rehabilitation mm -hmm. from the start, because Texas follows soon after. Their juvenile justice system, from the start, very openly, is not about rehabilitation. Wow. They specifically say, like, that's not our goal here. We are here to punish kids. Gatesville wow. became what one activist group described as an instrument of torture. In 1912, a new superintendent for the facility ordered the banning of several forms of corporal punishment that had started in the late 1800s. And these sound somewhat tortury. I'm going to read a quote from Who Gets a Childhood. If you want, this will give you some context on what it's like being in a juvenile prison in Texas oh, no. in the late 1800s and start okay. of the 1900s. Adams outlawed pulling toes in which boys were forced to stand holding their toes with their hands indefinitely and bustings what? in which boys were made to stand with their arms held over their heads while a guard flogged them with a bat. I don't wait. think that's flogging. That's just I hitting like, that's a kid with a bat. Wait, wait, wait. That's, that's not, not flogging. 
A flogging is something soft, right? It's pretty ugly yeah. too. But like, that's just hitting a kid with a bat. Oh, like, <laughs> that's no. not flogging. That's yeah. not flogging. That's just beating a child with a heavy stick. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, mm-hmm. I was like, this. The image is egregious, and the sentence for which you mm-hmm. used to explain the image is egregious because that's bad. not flogging. Mm-hmm. Now. So in 1912, this new superintendent uh, orders these things banned mm-hmm. and the guards revolt. Um, they oh initially God. express their displeasure by allowing more than two dozen kids to escape over a three day period. Right. So they just stop doing their jobs. We'll, we'll show you. Um, you want to be nice they, to these kids. We'll yeah. Put them on the streets. See we'll how put them you on like the it. streets. And then you'll see, yeah. you know. Um, and yeah, they wa- eventually they walk off the job, just completely strike, which forces the superintendent to recruit local citizens, most of whom supported the guards to serve in their place. And obviously very little gets actually changed yeah. because, it, and this will be a pattern. This is the, these trends will continue through the rest of the story. Oh my God. Why are uh, you Someone, on in this case, the guy running it, it like yeah. recognizes a problem, tries yeah. to change it. And a mix of the guards working at the facility and the local citizens say, absolutely not. You ain't improving shit shit and nothing gets done can you imagine that you're unionizing and somebody's like why y'all using unionizing because they won't let us beat the kids with bats yeah imagine like a couple of like well we're unionizing because we're all going to die from the black lung and we'd like our pet families to get slightly more money and maybe have weekends off oh well Fair we're enough. unionizing because people keep burning to death in garment fires they won't let me hit kids with a bat anymore yeah you like yo yo. our struggles are the same solidarity forever (laughs) whose man's is this like who invited these fools who's written nah y'all gotta go (laughs) it's very funny that right around the same time like miners are fighting with machine guns and rifles for the right to have a life outside of the job and not be beaten by mine by the boss's guards other guys are striking for the right to beat kids with baseball bats kids with bats listen that is the the yeah. quintessential, the absolute, mm-hmm. the a perfect example of yo, whose man's is this? Mm-hmm. Like yo, who who's man who who let them in? Mm-hmm. That's not we not the same, fam. Yeah. Well, and probably a bleak story is how many of those other union men would see this as the same struggle because a lot of racism <laughs> yeah. in the union struggle. So you know, <laughs> but Back you know who's people. not. Yeah. In favor of flogging children with baseball bats. Let me tell you who not. Products and services that support this podcast, unless it's the Washington State Highway Patrol. I don't know. Yeah. The FBI or. I got to tell you, man, that they look. That island ain't no game. They're often called the Washington State Highway Patrol of the food box industry. Listen, I am <laughs> team. That's right. Oh, we're back. So, um, prop. Yeah. Juvenile detention facilities spread across Texas throughout the first half of the 20th century. They came to be known as reform schools or training schools, even though neither of those things was ever much neither of a priority. Neither are happening. Yes. yes. We will call it a school. <laughs> <laughs> school of hard knocks. <laughs> <laughs> this is school in the sense that we got some mm-hmm. desks. Yeah. Fucking dude <laughs> walks in with a baseball bat, slams it on the table. Who's ready to learn calculus? <laughs> <laughs> uh, carry the one martinez <laughs> hits the kid with a bat like God. yeah Not you funny. get this one wrong and i'm gonna bunt you yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> this is not so. funny Okay. Yeah, uh, Gatesville remained the most brutal of the juvenile prisons in Texas. It was so bad that it had to build a cemetery on its grounds because what? so many boys were dying in custody. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when your child in prison get needs to, to add a cemetery, maybe, maybe we got a problem. <laughs> you kill. Well, I'm, I'm guessing guys. the kids who wind up there, like they don't have any parents left alive or something, right? True. Like maybe they're kids that are total wards of the state or whatever, and so it doesn't matter what happens to them in the eyes of the state. You can just throw them in an unmarked grave. No one now, cares. One of the worst cases of this occurred in 1921 when a guard strangled a 15 year old named Dell Timms to death in front of two other boys. So, wow, not good places. 1921. Eventually, all the stories of abuse led to enough outrage that in 1948, the state legislature appointed a special commission to study these schools. So the state of Texas, boy, kids are 
20 years later could get strangled like, to death right like yeah it takes a while stuff yeah. builds there's other deaths there's a lot of a lot of complaints but eventually the state of texas is like well it's our duty we got to get in there and really look at these these facilities um if one guy dies hmm? you know yeah two guys dies hey maybe they were together 10 now, guys die maybe we should call we'll have a guy look into it yeah. Like d- 10 kids getting beaten to death is like That's a the lot. equivalent of like when your washing machine floods the house for the third time and you're like, all right, I got to call a fucking dude. I should probably call somebody <laughs> right now. <Yeah. laughs> um, so the Washington Post reports, quote, when experts and reformers visited the facilities, they recommended placing them entirely with it within with smaller facilities located near metropolitan areas. In addition to removing the stigma of prison, such facilities would place youths closer to their families and enable the state to bring in professionals from the fields of child care, education and mental health, a community based vision similar to today's group homes and halfway houses. So that's not that's pretty good mm. advice. Given the state of things, that seems like an yeah. improvement. Yeah. But the legislature rejected this advice absolutely not did. yeah <laughs> Let's, what is the most sensible mm-hmm. humane like kids should probably be near their parents and experts and stuff who can yeah, help maybe them. we should get somebody that understands kids mm-hmm. around here oh that, that pisses people absolutely off. not there there was <laughs> riots when they tried to stop the baseball bat beatings of course they're not putting these kids in a different facility <laughs> he nope, the demands what we're doing of, is perfect <laughs> yeah <laughs> Heeding the demands of the politically well-connected leaders of the state's youth prisons who used the specter of black and Mexican-American criminality to insist that young people required imprisonment, Texas instead expanded its construction of ever more sprawling prison-like facilities, sometimes strategically located in the electoral districts of key legislators. Mm. Abuse scandals continued to surface in television and newspaper reports. In 1952, a Houston lawyer filed an appeal on behalf of a 16-year-old girl who had spent nearly 200 days in ISIS isolation in the Gainesville State School after being held down by male guards and forcibly sedated with barbiturates. Another girl who escaped the same facility told a reporter for the Austin Statesman, I'll kill myself before returning. Mm. Mm-hmm. And that'll let you know how it's going in there. Yep. So we've had two attempts to reform things, first in yeah. 1912, then in 1948, two big attempts. Uh, so far, they both met with massive protests from the people who lived in and around, and also protests from lawmakers who know that if you put a child prison in a town where maybe you don't have a great electoral edge, suddenly all the people who get jobs there, that's your voting base, and you can Dude. like lock that shit down. It's like... I can't believe I'm saying this, but like, yeah, in Texas defense, they tried at some yeah. point to do something reasonable. And it was like, well, well, Texas going Texas. <laughs> Never mind. It was Texas that stopped anything reasonable <laughs> yeah. from happening. So yeah. I don't know about in their defense. In the defense of the individuals who tried to reform yeah. things. Yeah. The 15 people that flew in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Those folks were at least on the right track. It was like, oh, well, never mind. Yeah. By 1964, things were bad enough that a mix of parents and former Gatesville employees wrote a letter to President Lyndon Baines Johnson and the governor of Texas. Um, they described the kind of abuse we've discussed already in this episode at length and compared the training school to, quote, a concentration camp. Mm. Um and man, statistically, at least one or two of those people had to have known what a concentration camp yeah, looked I was like, like, right? They, Some of them were World War II vets or something. Like, we kind of know what we're talking about, Joe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There was somebody in there who was like, I've seen a fucking concentration yeah. camp and this place doesn't look good. <laughs> yeah. I was there, bro. I was there. Yeah. So this leads to the biggest flurry of investigations yet. The FBI and the Texas Rangers both launch investigations into these facilities, Gatesville in particular, but also the juvenile uh, justice system, in te- like the juvenile um, incarceration system in Texas, um, and also both houses of the Texas legislature launch investigations. So you've got like four mm-hmm. big investigations going yeah. on, right? One of them federal. Um, and when the FBI starts investigating stuff like this, for all of the good tricks we have, them, they always find shit, right? Yeah, you they're, they're going to figure the most, it out. <laughs> the most detailed documentation of a number of different law enforcement agencies' crimes comes from FBI investigations. Now, here's another fun question. Does it ever lead to anything? 
No, never, never, no, no. no. I was like, you no, they like, find yeah. a guy. <laughs> they find a guy. Out. Nothing happens. Yeah, but they, they find him. Um, like in in Oregon right now, the Portland police are currently in contempt of the Justice Department uh, for repeatedly refusing to reform their use of force policies and being unconscionably so brutal that these federal criminal justice system says you guys can't do this. And wow. currently, they've just said yes, we can, and we'll see if anything happens. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> It's absolutely fine. And of course, in this case, nothing happens. All of these mm. investigations start. Um, and there's like, there's again, sweeping reports of abuses, horrible details about all the bad shit that's happening. The FBI is like, yeah, bad shit's happening. Texas Rangers are like, yeah, bad shit's happening. Both houses of legislature in Texas are like, yeah, bad shit's happening. Um, no, very little reforms happen. Uh, attempts to make serious reforms are shut down at every pass by, again, local and state elected leaders who had mm. training schools in their districts and didn't want to lose money. Yeah. By 1974, the reform movement was desperate enough that a bunch of former inmates, parents, and activists launched a class action lawsuit in federal court. This case, Morales v. Terman, brought another wave of psychologists, social workers, and prison consultants to not just Gatesville, but other juvenile detention facilities. Now, the guy who winds up in charge of this big investigation is a dude with a, the incredible name, Judge William Wayne Justice. That's that boy's name. Judge Justice. That's right. Yeah. Judge yeah. William Wayne Justice. He what an incredible Texas judge name. Yeah, he only had one choice for his career. <laughs> like, that's the, You will never convince me that's not the name of the judge in the best little whorehouse in Texas. Like, yeah, there's no other... Yeah, yeah, that's what you call that guy. Like, retroactively, put a judge yeah. in there, make that his name. William Absolutely. Wayne Justice. What an incredible name for a judge. Wayne, too. Um... Yeah. yeah, it's everything. Everything is in that name. Um, so he 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 takes this very seriously. Uh, he tours the he Mountain better. View School for Boys, uh, and he finds, as he does a surprise inspection of this facility, that the children there were, like, this judge is walking around, he sees children caked in old blood. Like, oh my God. Like, just left on yeah. their bodies, covered in bruises. And, like, whenever he tries to talk to them, they, like, skirt, they're terrified just of his presence. Like, they've been yeah. trained to just react with, like, unthinking terror to the, the presence of an adult. Yeah. Um, Howard Omart was also there. He was an expert. He was from the LBJ administration. He was an expert LBJ sent along uh, to, like, look at things while Judge Justice was there. Mm -hmm. um, and Howard Omart later said, quote, we have never seen anything quite as depressing, so deliberately designed to humiliate, to degrade, and to debase. It is surely oppression in its simplest and most direct form. That is the worst, man. Yeah. Yeah, designed to humiliate, degrade, I, and debase. Yeah. That's that's LBJ's man, and Judge Justice comes to the same conclusions. Yeah, and I um, mean, it's not like LBJ is like the greatest dude, but for no. him to be like... Yo, this is wild. Yeah. I showed yeah. my dick to a Secret Service agent this morning, but even yeah. I think this is beyond the yeah, pale. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I pissed I on my own bodyguard once. Shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you have any idea how many people I've killed? Yeah. I ordered the firebombing of a country. Yeah. <laughs> but this isn't right. <laughs> yeah. But that's wild, dog. Yeah. They're doing these kids This place wrong. is fucked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So the extensive investigation spurred by the Morales v. Terman case revealed regular use of isolation in Texas juvenile criminal justice facilities, um, forced psychotropic drugs on children, and also rare forms of torture. Among other things, investigators found that children were being punished physically for speaking Spanish. So-called punk dorms had been created for juveniles the guards decided were homosexual. By this point, the Ugh. state had overcome its squeamishness at incarcerating women, and in one facility, guards were found to have forced abortions on pregnant inmates. Ugh. Yeah. Oh my god, dude. A boy at Gatesville told a judge about a hazing ritual, uh, told the judge, Judge Justice, about a hazing yeah. ritual he'd been forced to undergo, where a group of boys beat him unconscious while guards watched. To his credit, Judge Justice, I don't know about the rest of his career... Judge in Texas in the 70s, maybe he got up to some fucked up shit. Yeah. But in this case, he is as good as his name. And he issues a sweeping ruling that outlaws all of the fucked up shit found at the facilities and Love requires it. medical, psychological, and educational services to be made available for any children in a Texas juvenile justice facility uh, or juvenile detention facility. The entire leadership of the state agency that oversaw these facilities was forced to resign. Texas good. put money into probation and other preventative measures. And the juvenile 
juvenile inmate population declined rapidly. So this is this is the first time that like real shit does happen. God did the like, right thing. Th- yeah. Th- th- this is a this makes the situation better. Judge Justice gets credit in this. He's a big part of like why less kids are in this system. However, it's as the Washington Justice. Post reports, quote. The impact of Morales and other important federal court rulings was blunted by the persistence of structural racial disparities and renewed fears of violent juvenile crime. And while the Federal Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act of 1974 provided even more funding for state and local reforms, these kind of like prevention measures and whatnot, Mm -hmm. historian Elizabeth Hinton has noted that it also labeled, quote, economically vulnerable youths, most of whom are black or Latino, as potentially criminal. That's the term used, potentially criminal criminal. Um, criminal. Yeah. While removing white middle class offenders from the formal justice system. And that's why the juvenile inmate system declines, right? It's because they put less white kids there. Yep. Like that's the big, the big, which is good, right? It's like no kid deserves to be in a locker. It's yeah, good that nope. lesser in there, but it doesn't fix anything, you know? Nah, you don't want nobody in that system. But no, like, nobody fix should anything. be in that you system. You just played the numbers. And that is yeah. that is the main thing is that the criminalization of white and mainly white middle class because I think some white poor kids still wind up in these places. Yeah, yeah, they still. Um, wind up. But um, the criminalization of like white middle class kids stops mm-hmm. to a large degree. Um, yeah, which is again, they're, like uh, good. They're mischievous. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're just yeah, you know, it's boys being boys. Yeah, mischievous. It's like a know? racist firefighter who only rescues the white kids, and it's like, well, it's good that less kids died in the fire, but you shouldn't yeah. be a firefighter. <laughs> hey, bro. <laughs> yeah. like, <laughs> you want me to pat you on the back for that? I mean, I guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that kid's happy. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. I, like, I still feel like you shouldn't be doing this job. <laughs> I still feel like, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if you should get a plaque or anything for this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So in the late 70s and early 80s, things were, though, trending in a better direction. Um, and again, the, the decline in the prison, because it is, I, I should be fair, there is a reduction in the number of, of, of black yeah. and Hispanic kids who are sent to these facilities. That does go down. Like, it's mm. not complete, but it is largely the number of the kids who don't, who stop going to these facilities are largely white, right? It is largely yeah. based on race. Not to... Because again, I don't want to. I also don't want to be like completely shitting on the people who achieved this. Because it's good. Um, nah, it just, yeah. And the idea that like you can't beat me with a bat no more. Like the fact that a judge was like, "Well, look, man, a prop. Oh, <laughs> a judge shit. did say that. It does not stop. <laughs> oh God. But I'm just saying, like, let me at least give him that. That you, was yeah, like, no, that they do not get. They beat them. No, they like, put less kids in these facilities. No, they keep beating them. They keep right the hell oh, on beating them. They was like, nah, we worried about volume. Yeah, like, yeah, quality is wanna, different. We yeah. want like a more boutique experience where we really give each kid the beating they deserve. You know, yeah. our guards oh, were just hitting man. too many kids. They were losing their passion for it. You do know, you, do you did you watch uh, did you watch the Dave Chappelle show when it was on? Oh, yeah, absolutely. OK. Do you remember the uh, the gay Klansman? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He was just like, we're like the clan. We're just a little nicer. Yeah. So we'll just we'll just <laughs> ask you to leave, preferably back to Africa. Yeah. You know, we're just like, got it. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, that's kind of what we've done here. Um, yeah. Now, in the late, yeah, so again, things are getting a little bit better in the late 70s and early 1980s. Like, there mm-hmm. are improvements, but then, like we talked about in our first episode, that's when crime really starts to rocket upwards, right? And yeah. all crime, but that does include juvenile crime. And the panic over super predators hits the media. Yeah. Between 1990 and 1996, 40 states expanded the number of juvenile cases that could be tried in adult court and given adult punishments. And no state went harder than Texas. When he ran for governor in 1994, George W. Bush campaigned with a promise to lock up more children. In 1995, after he won, the state legislature passed an omnibus bus juvenile justice reform bill, which brought even tougher sentencing for kids accused of crimes. The state budgeted another $200 million for facilities, which was enough to triple their capacity to incarcerate children. So like Texas is like, we got to have at least three times as many kids locked up in this fucking state. Yeah, that, that'll prove Thanks, that George I'm w. doing Bush. my job. Yeah. It is worth noting, we forget sometimes, because the crimes against humanity he committed as president were so extreme. He did some of that while he was governor, he, too. He kinda, he, his <laughs> mixtapes were pretty crazy. Like, yeah, y'all, yeah. y'all only looking at his major albums. I'm like, his mixtapes mm-hmm. were pretty crazy. Yeah, it's also yeah, important exactly. to remember, like, how all this is tied to, like, 
crack. Mm-hmm. Oh yes, I, I, and that's that's too much to delve. But yeah. yes, that is a, a big like part you, of the story. And I'm yeah. like, and let's not let's not forget how we got crack. So yeah. let's just we'll put that on the side. So like, yeah, it's funny how crime went yeah. up. Well, you know I mean. Well, there's, well, there's, yes. Well, you like with crack. every evil thing in American yeah, history, so, the CIA is involved, just yeah, not so directly you, in this part of it. <laughs> got a game's yeah. crack, though. Yeah. 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 And that, that is a big part of like why yeah. there's all of this like terror over juvenile offenders and a big yeah. thing that like Bush and other Republicans campaign on. Mm. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So we'll do, we'll talk, we'll do a crack episode at some point. We really got to get into that. You do it with that. me, too. It's yeah, yeah. It's there's um, we a need to do boy. a whole thing. Iran yeah. Contra scandal, like mm-hmm. crack in the streets, Nicaragua, everything. Anyway, yeah. okay, that's a whole other thing. Mm-hmm. I'm yeah, saying it right now, so do that with me. <laughs> <Yeah>. Yes, <laughs> we'll get a couple of parts in there. Yes. Um, so uh, this period, um, the 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 '90s, kind of the early, the mid '90s, when Bush gets elected, and you've got like this mm-hmm. omnibus juvenile justice reform bill, it's noteworthy in Texas because it's when they really everyone stops. It had kind of been trending this way, but they re, this is when people really stop calling these places training schools and reform schools. Mm-hmm. Those terms die. The idea of like trying to hide what these places are dies because the people who want more of them just call them youth prisons, and they're proud yeah. of that. They yeah. love the idea Cowboys. that they're making youth yeah. prisons. Like, they don't want to hide that shit. Because, nah. like, you get elected for being like, oh, hell yeah, we're going to throw a bunch of fucking kids in lock them up. You yeah. think we got youth prisons now? When I'm governor, way more youth prisons. <laughs> I'm going to put all your kids. Wait a minute. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to put all their kids in prison. And while they tripled their capacity to lock kids up, Texas also doubled the number of kids they were executing. Now, in oh the United God. States prop, from 1985 to 2005, 23 children were executed. 13 of those were in texas are you serious yeah i didn't know you, this texas fucking loves executing children oh my know god this. oh yeah we are look the united states has an executing children problem but it's also largely a texas problem <laughs> <laughs> you know that is that's a lot yeah Pretty there's a bunch of other states i don't know if you're aware there's like 49 of them <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> I did not know that. Yeah. I am in shock and awe. Oh right yeah, now. we are huge fans of executing children. God. Um, yeah, can't get enough of it, really. Now, this all continued swimmingly until February 16th, 2007, when the Texas Observer published an article about a horrific sex abuse scandal in a juvenile correction facility near Odessa in West Texas. And I'm going to quote again from Who Gets a Childhood. News reports revealed that the school's assistant superintendent, Ray Brookins, and its principal, John Paul Hernandez, had coerced sexual favors from several juvenile inmates over a period wow. of at least two years. Compounding the alleged crime was an inexplicably slow response from authorities. Between December 2003 and February 2005, staff complaints about Brookins's and Hernandez's suspicious behavior had fallen on deaf ears in the upper echelons of the Texas Youth Commission, TYC, the agency charged with administering the state's juvenile facilities. Finally, In February of 2005, Mark Slattery, a volunteer math tutor from nearby Midland, was approached by two students who wanted to confess something icky. As Slattery later told a reporter, I knew it must have been something bad if they had no word for it. Slattery soon discovered that boys were being led into the administration building each night for forced encounters with Brookins, who had used his power to unilaterally lengthen or shorten youth sentences to exact sex from inmates. He can make you stay longer if you don't fuck him. Oh my god. And that's what he does. Oh, this just. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. It's about as bad as it gets right there. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Shout out, though, to Mark Slattery. Uh, Yeah. It is important to note that, like, this guy clearly cares about these kids, is volunteering to teach, like, not getting paid, volunteering to teach math to incarcerated kids. Yeah. Because it's important for them to learn. And they clearly, it says a lot about him that these kids know we can trust Mr. Slattery. We can trust you. We can yeah. tell him this and he'll he'll do something about yeah. it. By God, he does. Yeah. Um, so fucking give this guy something. I don't yeah. know, a house, whatever. Yeah, this um, mug is a, this is a mixed bag this episode yeah. where there's yeah. like, some dudes are dope, some dudes are like yeah. actual bastards, yeah. You do have to, like this is an overwhelmingly bleak story, but whenever you get those those little heroes, you gotta like yeah. acknowledge that shit because most sure. people- clearly didn't do what Mark did. Yeah. Um, so 
uh, it's pretty bad. Uh, it's pretty bad. And again, the Texas Rangers get involved. And this time they were a little more effective than they had been last time. Brookins and Hernandez are charged with a bunch of crimes. Uh, both men are forced to resign. But the criminal cases against them grind to a halt in the local county prosecutor's office. And the U.S. Attorney's Office in San Antonio refuses to get involved. What? It's like, again... Why do you like this is this is bad for business. It's bad for everybody oh if this becomes God. a bigger thing yeah. than it needs to be. And this is thankfully where journalists come in. So obviously yes. this gets out. This is a fuck as everyone's yes. reactions. This is a fucked up story. Oh, yeah. The Dallas Morning News is is like, all right, well, let's do a journalism here. We Because if, if this is happening, there's probably some other shit that's going on. If there's one, there's four. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So they carry out a huge investigation, which concludes that the Texas juvenile justice system had created, quote, a culture in which prison officials were free to abuse their power and punish children who tried to complain about them. So this story mm. goes viral. National news starts to get on the trail. After the Dallas Morning News covers, it's a pretty big paper. Um, mm-hmm. The big guys, the really big guys start yeah. to get in there. Follow-up investigations would eventually find more than 2,000 confirmed allegations of staff on inmate violence between 2003 and 2006, including more, de- more than 60 cases of kids with suspicious broken bones. To try and quiet up outrage, Texas launched an abuse hotline for their child prisons, which racked up 1,100 complaints in its first month so god dog you know it it gets big it reveals a bunch the the tip of the iceberg is revealed obviously i'm gonna guess more than two thousand times staff beat kids in a three-year period in all the texas prisons probably a couple times i'm gonna guess more than 60 kids had broken bones i'm gonna Um, guess more than 60 because you know these are also kids they're teens there's a lot of oppositional defiance i'm sure there's some kids who get bones broken and don't want to tell anyone because like i don't want you to know you i don't want you to know you hurt me you know yeah Um, or i don't want anyone like you know uh, and obviously shit gets covered up. It gets hidden. Um, I'm sure it's a lot higher, the actual yeah. number. They started releasing child prisoners. Texas did. And in March of 2007, a Department of Justice investigation concluded and found that conditions in the Evans, E-V-I-N-S, Regional Juvenile Center in Edinburgh, Texas, were bad mm-hmm. enough that they had violated the constitutional rights of imprisoned youth to be protected from harm while in state custody. Evans had an assault rate five times the national average. Once this news broke, what? there were more stories about the horrific conditions in the facility. William Bush writes, one of the the most watched cases was that of Shaquanda Cotton, a 15-year-old African-American girl from the East Texas town of Paris, who received an indeterminate terminate sentence, an indeterminate sentence up to age 21 for shoving a hall monitor in school. What? Portrayed in the net, yeah, she shoves a hall monitor and she gets an open-ended sentence. We can keep you in up until you're 21 if we want to. What the fuck is an open-ended monitor. sentence? Yeah. I've never it, even this happens heard a of lot. That. So because of the way the Texas juvenile justice system gets, a lot of these are for like up to five years. Again, yeah. that's why those, that's what we, we talked about. Like those people, those, uh, the superintendents of those facilities of that facility being like, Hey, if you don't fuck me, I'll keep you here longer. That's why they can keep them here longer. They have, ju- they get to decide how long uh, the sentence is. It's an up to this long in prison. That's and, the difference. Okay. Now I'm seeing like difference yeah. between California and cause I'm like at 18, you like it gets your record sealed mm-hmm. like when you're a juvenile yeah it's Dang. i mean it's it's fucked up um i mean you could get transferred to the, like the adult prison but yeah. like Dang, for them to be like, nah, we'll keep you at T21, because, dang, that's yeah. crazy. So, yeah. uh, Shaquanda Cotton, th- this story goes really viral. People are horrified. The national press covers it. Um, it gets looked at as a victim, as, like, racially motivated. Mm-hmm. Um, and she gets a release in March 2007. She becomes kind of a cause celeb for how, like, racist the Texas juvenile justice system is. Yeah. Um, she subsequently described conditions at the Ron Jackson State Juvenile Correction Complex in Brownwood uh, during an interview in 17 17- magazine quote seeing the barbed wire fences and guards terrified me i was given an orange jumpsuit and socks and taken to my quarters a tiny room that had only a bed a bookshelf and a desk some of the other inmates had committed serious crimes like murder this was wait you said 17 magazine yeah she does a, an interview for 17 for 17 that's kind of wow yeah but yeah good for 17 yeah i don't know 17 was doing that's some, like, that's some teen vogue shit right there yeah, yeah. I was or i guess like, teen vogue is doing some 17 shit i don't know that's really because i'm yeah. like 17 predates them i remember mm-hmm. i remember 17 magazine running around the hood and it mm-hmm. was just the stuff that like for the 
for the little girls and it's like dang i didn't know they was about it like that what year was this um god this is like 2007 2008 oh, okay it's a little more yeah. recent then yeah okay, 2007. My bad. yeah 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 okay. so like the internet's kind of up and running at this point they, i mean yeah. they're still body shaming girls but at least yeah. they're doing these articles about girls yeah prison. at least they did this yeah so people start to care again about abuses mm-hmm. in texas state facilities whistleblowers come forward randall chance a former inspector for the state's juvenile correction facilities says mm-hmm. in an interview that quote and this is him randall chance like works for the the state juvenile correction Correction agency, and he's an ins- he inspects facilities. He gives an interview where he says, "Staff are being paid your tax money to rape your children." Oh my god! <laughs> yeah. Oh That's my! God. Not very sparing. Let me cut yeah. it straight shot, no chaser, homie. Yeah. Let me cut it very clean for you. Yeah. This was happening. Mm-hmm. Dang. Uh, he describes TYC, the agency he works for, as a dynasty of corruption that condone- condones the mistreatment of youth in its care. So again, reforms are demanded. The TYC governing board is overhauled. They throw out the old guys running it, bring in new ones. A state investigation is ordered. And as you'd expect, it found a lot of evidence of individual wrongdoing. The blame was placed on the culture of the agency, which was described as having somehow become uniquely toxic. Little discussion focused around the fact that Texas had been this bad for two thirds of a century. So again, this keeps, this is what happens every time when there, when something gets done, it's, we're going to arrest and charge these individual guys who committed crimes. Um, and we've got to, you know, there's a problem with the culture. We have to fire these dudes at the top and we have to reform the agency to fix the culture because it's a culture problem. And I, I think at this point in the story, it should be clear it's not a culture problem. It's a child prison problem. This is what happens when you have them. They keep trying to reform the culture and the exact same thing happens over and over again. Reforms are fought by the people who live there because there's money in there and by local politicians because that's where they get voters and and fucking campaign donations from. Um, And the abuse continues because the kind of people who are going to work the kind of jobs that are available at these facilities in the middle of nowhere, which don't pay well, are people who get... Um, are willing to take a pay cut to get to hit kids or molest them. Like, it's not a culture problem. It's a child prison yeah. problem. The They're concept. bad things to have. Yeah. It's not the <laughs> culture of this toxic planet. Yeah. It's the fact that you're on a toxic planet. I mean, yeah. It's a culture in that, like, if you design a gun that can only shoot seven-year-olds... <laughs> and the people who buy them, yeah, there's a culture problem among the people who buy the guns that can only shoot seven year olds. Yeah. Like, but I guess, yeah, they're probably all very unpleasant people, but that's not really the problem, is it? Problem it's that is we built a gun, gun to shoot seven year olds. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. The issue is, is, is not the, the people buying these are bad. <laughs> like yeah. they are sure, but that's really not where the problem started. Is it both and situation here, guys? Do we need these things? <laughs> nah, it's not an either or. I feel like it's a both and. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you know who doesn't shoot seven-year-olds, Prop? Unless, Unless it's the Washington State yeah, Highway was, Patrol again, in, in which case they do. Um, but probably not. Unless it's also, unless it's then potentially yes. Ah, uh, we're back. So if you were an optimistic type, you for, could be forgiven for looking at the fallout from the 2007 revelations of horrific abuse in Texas facilities and thinking like, shit, things are headed in the right direction again. Like this might, yeah. we might, we might fix a lot of stuff and a lot of good stuff does happen. I should say yeah. that Texas closes more than half of their youth prisons. They gut the juvenile justice system. They dramatically reduce the number of incarcerated kids and resources are diverted from incarcerating kids to programs to try and prevent youth crime. This is great. Like again, this is a big deal, but it's a big deal because it removes kids from the system. Um, Journalists and politicians who demanded change and brought out this information improve material conditions for the kids who get released and the kids who don't go to juvenile prison because that becomes less common. That is undeniable. But it is not a reform of these facilities because if it was a reform, it would mean that the facilities themselves are getting better. And that's not what happens. The facilities continue to be a fucking nightmare. There's less kids in them. Again, that's huge. Really big deal. But for those inside Side, it a lot of basically my I don't have a, a way of claiming this in any objective sense because again our data is always Im- imperfect here but like the same problems continue to persist yeah so it's like 
the the statistics go down because there's just less humans. Yeah, the reform is we got to take kids out of this thing, which might suggest that like if we really wanted to reform it, we would not let any kids be in you these could places. Close it. Yeah, yeah <laughs> we could close that. it forever. Yeah. I mean, then there'd be no kids in it. That might work. That yeah. would be my argument. Um, yeah. And again, obviously, the people who succeed in this, it's not abolition, but it's a lot less kids in prison. That's great. But again, the facilities stay exactly the yeah. same as they've been for a century. So fast forward right. 10 years, 2017. The Dallas Morning News publishes a blockbuster investigation into abuses at the Gainesville State School, which despite its name is a child prison. It just happens to have some desks. Here's how that article opened, Prop. Yep. Youths at the Gainesville State School say staff paid them with drugs and cash to assault one another. A psychologist at the campus gave pornography to a boy there to encourage the young man to masturbate in front of him. A youth attacked a guard and stole stole his radio so he couldn't call for help. By the time he the help arrived, the officer had a broken nose and needed four stitches over his eye. So it's a wild west in there. Yeah, it's the wild west in there. And like the same abuses are happening. And like the, that staff paying kids with drugs and cash to assault each other. That's bounties. That's like there's this whole system where the guards when kids will like fuck with them. Sometimes it's cases like this where they beat up a guard. But oftentimes it's just a kid they find annoying. They yeah. will pay other kids with drugs. They'll like give kids cocaine and heroin to beat the shit out of kids who annoy them. That's an endemic yeah. problem in this facility. That's unfortunately. Well, yeah. Rant, not, not common not normal. Yeah. 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 It's everywhere. Um, yeah. But it's usually not kids. Like It's usually not children. This is yeah. being done to. Um, but again, Texas doesn't really see the need to treat them as children. Nope. Uh, now, that article had a lot of really good stuff in it. Very important piece of journalism. Um, but it still contains some of the same problems we've seen over and over again. Here's one line I found particularly frustrating. It's a bad culture, said Debbie Unruh, an independent watchdog charged with ensuring the safety of youths in the Texas Juvenile Justice Department's custody. It's a dangerous culture. And again, that's true. It's a bad culture. The culture of like guys who wear guards in child yeah. prisons is bad. Um, but that's not the central problem. Um, it, 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 the claim that like it's a problem with the culture at this prison might hold water if we didn't have a century of documentation that this happens in every one of these facilities that the state of Texas yeah. operates. It's constant and it's for generations. Um, the article quoted juvenile justice advocates who once again complained that part of the problem was locked kids in remote rural facilities far from home, um, which is absolute, absolutely true, right? If you are yeah. looking at ways to minimize harm, don't put them so far away where there's no services. Yeah. Uh, and like the um, frequency of your family visiting. Yeah. It's going to be higher, which is, is good for you. The hotter it is. Yeah. Yeah. Now, that article also contains more detail about the staff psychologist who gave a child pornography so that he could watch that child masturbate. Um, and I'm going to read a quote about that now. Vincent Rager, now 31, began working at Gainesville in 2015. His online resume indicates he provided individual psychotherapy to boys at the school. Rager resigned during the investigation, officials said. R records show he resigned in lieu of, vol of involuntary separation, so he resigns in order to avoid being fired. Of course. Reached by phone earlier this week, Rager said he resigned because he wanted to move to California. Rager now works as a clinical psychologist treating male prisoners at Kern Valley State Prison in Bakersfield, wow. California. <laughs> now, they're does. adults. Well, they're grown ups, so it's different. So that's better. Oh my. oh, my God. I might say you should never get to work as a clinical yeah, psychologist again if you do like, that. Like that might, that might disqualify you for doing that ever. I feel like you should, you should not have a license to do any of this. Yeah, yeah. 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 So again, oh uh, we should consider perhaps the possibility that like this is not just a problem with like Texas. It is also an American problem, right? The, he, he goes right away and gets a job in fucking California. How do you like, uh, are we that hard pressed for people to care well, yeah. about, like we're that hard pressed for like empl employment? Or yeah, empl well, these facilities are in the middle of nowhere. They pay for yeah. shit. Um, yeah. It's not enjoyable work. It's not very well respected respected work so like I'm, there i know there are good people doing that job in in the system but like a lot of bad people of get course. that because it's like you're not you getting the very be, best generally yeah you have to be mission driven yeah if you're gonna stay in the that work because the work is trash 
Yeah, and it's it's yeah. like you obviously you get great teachers in these juvenile facilities sometimes, like the guy we already talked, Mark Slattery, the guy we yeah. talked about. And that's who, what I'm saying. Yeah. Like that's where I started teaching. I started yeah. teaching in juvenile facilities. I was like, man. But yeah. Also, you're gonna get a bunch of basket cases who this is the gig they could get because they did something. Yeah. And it's yeah. not if it's easy to not like your as this whole episode is, it's easy to not care and still get away with it because yeah. you're just from a teacher perspective it's just some couple packets it's like continuation yeah. school if anybody ever been to that it's like it's packets you just fill out the packets yeah. and i just make sure you guys don't hurt each other and the way that i'm sitting right now y'all can't see this listeners but like my feet are like leaned up against the wall i'm leaning back with the mic in my i don't have to care about i can sit like this for the 30 minutes of class and just make sure you don't stab each other and if yeah. you do all i gotta do is call the po and he comes in yeah and then you'll have then you'll go you know to a worse place potentially yeah basically um, like i don't well, have to so you have to yeah you have to care if you're gonna be in it yeah and you get in these places special ed isn't all that different you get this mix of like the most dedicated wonderful yeah. caring people imaginable and Every, like uh, people who are either just waiting out a clock and then a tiny number of people who are fucking monsters and know that that's monsters. where the least lies are, uh, eyes yes. are on them, you know? Yes. Um, and perhaps more could be done to make more caring and wonderful people able to do that job and fewer, sorry, at least fewer monsters. I'm not going to say like, look, you're always going to have some people waiting out the clock, but you don't have to have the monsters. <laughs> exactly. We can avoid having, we can avoid, like let's set that monsters. as a goal. D- hire fewer monsters, monsters. <laughs> yeah. in as much as you can yeah you know because some people get through the cracks like yeah i ain't gonna lie i know some personal information about that but like yeah. some people get through the cracks but sure. you know somebody's obviously a monster maybe like that's maybe don't hire them yeah maybe maybe don't hire monsters speaking of monsters that somebody hired governor greg abbott um in 2017 this dude, there's okay. this all these well <laughs> this is i mean He's not the bad guy or the good guy here. He does okay. the thing that everyone else does every time something like this happens. There's this big investigation and all of this press about how bad Texas' juvenile justice system is, and he fires the person in charge, right? How many uh-huh. times has that happened, this fucking story? Yeah. There's a bunch of talk of reform and yada, yada, yada. Uh, that uh, nothing significant changes, um, or at least the changes do not fix all, all the problems that we have been talking about all episode. Um, here's the New York Times reporting in 2019. Quote, in October 2019, a prison officer who worked at a juvenile detention facility in Central Texas was charged with sexual assault and accused of forcing a boy in custody to perform oral sex on him in his cell. The incident came to light the day after the alleged crime, when the boy tried to kill himself. Two months before that, at another detention facility in Texas, a corrections officer was fired after a teenage girl said she was pregnant with his child. He was later charged in connection with that case. And in May of last year, another prison worker was arrested on charges that he had carried on a relationship relationship with the teenager who was on parole. At five state juvenile detention centers, the day-to-day conditions are relentlessly violent and oppressive, with guards often resorting to force, according to a complaint filed to the Justice Department. In 2019, prison staff used force on incarcerated children almost 7,000 times, equivalent to six times per child who was confined there. Whoa. Oh, my God. Yeah. Uh, this... It just feels so personal. Mm -hmm. Like, oh my God, dude. Yeah. Yeah. So these findings came courtesy of yet another Justice Department investigation. How many of those have we seen this episode, right? The DOJ investigated. Hooray! hooray! This Um, is too, and like, like, I hope we hear in the date, like this is 2019. Yeah, yeah. I know with COVID, it make it, that feels like a, you know, 1919 because of COVID, but that's, Three years ago, guys. Yeah. 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 Um, now, uh, that Justice Department investigation had started in 2018 when two Texas advocacy groups begged the federal government to intervene, arguing that Governor Abbott's promise to personally monitor the juvenile justice system would not be sufficient. Uh, it wasn't, which is why Duh. everything I read, you you know, was found. Yeah. Um, and obviously, it's good that the Justice Department documented this. Um, but at the same time, I think this is kind of a perfect example of the actual logic behind ACAB. I think 
think that mm-hmm. slogan's a lot less yeah. useful politically than it than it ever has been. But the sentiment behind it applies because these investigators, these Justice Department people documenting this, this is important work. It's important to document this. It's critical. Yeah. Um, and I think these, I'm sure these people care. I'm sure they see horrific abuse. They want to stop it. They document it. And I'm sure they go to bed each night exhausted and sad, but certain that they're doing work that needs to be done. Yeah. But as we've seen over and over again in this story, all of these investigations are part of how the system perpetuates itself. Guards rape and beat children. Whistleblowers and watchdogs complain. Government investigation leads to reform, and then guards keep raping and beating children. These investigations and the media cycle that follows them are a necessary part of the cathartic loop that Texas has been stuck in for more than 100 years. This is a part of the loop. This is how people how it gets perpetuated again and again. Not that like they're they're bad people for investigating this shit, but it also is like that when I say like, you know, all whatever, whatever are bastards or whatnot in the system. That's what we mean. The system, the system eliminates the possibility of being good because the system cannot be reformed. So even if you're working for something that looks like reform in the system, a lot of what you're going to be doing is keeping the loop going. And it's not that simple because obviously some of these investigations are part of why there's a massive reduction in the number of kids who are incarcerated. And that's huge. Um, So it's not, I don't want to be painting it as that simple, but like it does, it just doesn't get better. The actual prisons yeah. themselves don't get better. They, there are less kids in them and that's good, but the, yeah. the things keep happening because we just can't have these places and those things not happen. Yeah, that's the like, the argument about like abolition. It's just yeah. like, we just have to start over. Like, because yeah. reforms, you're just, it's just duct tape and it's not, and it's not stopping, it's not fixing the problem. Y'all just keep adding duct tape. And, it's and like, sometimes the duct tape muffles the sound from inside. Yeah. Ooh, that's you know, poetic, bro. Makes that's people beautiful. think that we fixed it. Yes. That's and pretty poetic there, Robert. I did every now and then. Every so, now and then. Yeah. Yeah. There's a part of me that questions the value of continuing to loop through all of these stories, all of these details of abuse, all uh-huh. of these statistics over and over again, every cycle that this happens in. Um, because again, I, I think the only real thing to do is empty these facilities out, burn them down and throw any person who suggests rebuilding them into the Gulf of Mexico. But that yeah. said, I also don't want to ignore the work that these, these journalists and these department of yeah. justice people do in, in documenting this because the stories of these invicti- these victims are important. Yeah. And so to close us out, I'm going to read one more quote from that article, uh, that I just cited from about Christy Dennis. Her son was 15 when he was sent to the McLennan County state juvenile correction facility in Mart, Texas quote, Miss Dennis was horrified when she called one day in 2019 and learned that her son had been beaten and taunted as guards apparently stood by. Her son was sent to the jail's doctors on one occasion, she said, and she was later told that many guards did not intervene because they were afraid of the youth themselves. Miss Dennis said her son ended up at the center after taking her car without permission several times and money from her purse. After talking to the authorities, she was advised that if she wanted to teach her son a lesson, he needed to go to a juvenile facility, a decision she... Miss Dennis said, a decision she ended up regretting. The attacks against her son escalated to the point where he begged guards to keep him in solitary confinement. Released Mm. in July 2020, months before his 17th birthday, he now works at a fast food restaurant and is earning his GED with plans to pursue welding. But he is not the same as he was before his detention, she said. He has PTSD. He hears a noise and he panics. And that's another does. important when we talk about the complicity in the system and the degree to which maybe some of these people documenting these abuses are even complicit. Another person or group of people who are complicit are parents in these communities, yeah. parents who turn in their kids, parents who support these yeah. laws, parents who, who support funding these places. Um, I think pr- it's probably fair to say that 100% of the adults I knew as a child um were to that degree complicit in this system because yeah. they supported keep opening more places, the politicians who supported these places, and they were convinced that it was the right thing to do. And yeah. the result of a lot of people being convinced that this is the right thing to do, it's not just the rapists and the murderers and the pedophiles um, or the venal politicians who make this possible. It's the people who think they're doing the best thing for society. And the result of everything, of both the actions of these horrible rapists and whatnot and pedophiles and the actions of what I'm sure are loving parents and dedicated employees in the Justice Department and whatnot, the result of all of that is a system that rapes, beats, and murders children on an industrial yeah. scale. I, that's why I opened this episode with like, I am a parent 
And the part of me that understands at least can empathize what it what it feels like to have a child that you don't know what to do with. Like, I deeply understand that, you know, um, and the part of you that like the reality that you're still unpacking your own trauma, like just from just the time of age of civilization we're in, it was like, like you said, we were old enough to where we could get spanked at school. Like that's, that's like, so we're like, yeah. it's not that long ago that we actually realized that that was barbaric. You know what I'm saying? So, so you're, you're, you're processing your own upbringing, realizing, and then the parts of you that feels like, like even with me where I'm like, well, I, there's been times that I've been like, well, I kind of earned that spanking. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like I probably should have got spanked for that. You know what I'm saying? That now I can't, I look at both my children and I'm like, Ain't no way in the damn world I will put my hands on my kids. You know what I'm saying? Like, it just seems so like unthinkable. Like that I don't, I just don't think I could, I could never do it. You know what I'm saying? But when I got married again, I'm black. Like black people spank their kids. When I got married, Southern people, they spank their kids. It's so mm -hmm. normal. And so I'm like, that no doubt in my mind, my parents love me. Like I'm not, I would never take that from my parents loved me. I have a great relationship with my parents, mm -hmm. with my mom at least. You know what I'm saying? But like, <laughs> You know, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and a, a better one with my father now. But like um, that being said, I'm like the part of me that understands that you're just like, I don't. And I'm from the city. So I'm just sometimes we'd be like, nah, then how we need to go to jail. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And then but then you get there, which is why I feel like sometimes for me and my wife, like us who've been advocates who have like, you know, been to the Congress, like stood to our, our front of our, our councilmen and been like, you know, our, our senators and been like, this shit got to stop. You know what I'm saying? Have like done the work, done the therapy for ourselves. We've made enough money to be able to do therapy for ourselves, to be able to be like, to come to the conclusions that we're at now, to be like, this shit isn't working. You know what I'm saying? And having the experience of like having friends that been through the system, you know, ourselves somehow, you know, having our own interactions yeah. with the system to be able to look at our own children and everybody else's children and be like, listen, this is not the answer. You know what I'm saying? And it's not, it's, it's not doing what you think it's doing. Sometimes I feel like that's a privilege of mine, even coming from poverty, mm -hmm. coming from the hood is having a privilege of understanding that like, Yo, the system you think is going to rehabilitate your children have has no that was never in their purview. You know what I'm saying? That was never that was never on the table was rehabilitating them. You know what I'm saying? Um so I raised my children in a different like even just looking at like my own like like friends being like, "Yeah, we don't spank our kids." And being like friends being like, "What? Like y'all I'll be like, no, like we've, you know what I'm saying? We, it's a, we're in a, it's all that to, I'm, I'm stuttering now because I feel so passionate about this to yeah. where it's like the complicit, cause you talked about the complicity and that's the yeah. complicity that like sits as a parent to where you're like, but I'm also terrified for my child and I don't want them to make bad decisions. And I feel like they not listening to me and I know what scared me straight was being scared. So I'm like, well, maybe that's going to. But then you realize it's like, no, you're creating a criminal. You're traumatizing your child and not understanding how you're traumatizing your child because you think they know you love them. But like all of that put together and then and then, like you said, like coming out of the other end and being like. I'm trying to do my best. I'm 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 rant, I'm saying a lot here because like again it's so important to me. I just like I just went through a situation on a other uh on a nonprofit I'm on the board of that like you know we had to go through a a, a moment to where it was like when you sit at the t I'd never been in a situation where I'm actually at the part of the table where I have the reins like I can actually make change here. You know what I'm saying where I'm like I'm actually the one in power now. Like I'm usually the one outside of the door. Now I'm actually in it. But then once you're sitting at that and you're like, oh man, there's like, there's really a lot at stake here. When I, if I make this decision, that seems so easy 
when I was outside. You know what I'm saying? But now that I'm in and you're like, that's like you like how you keep trying to like balance your understanding of like these journalists and these like justice workers that were like, yo, like we're doing what is obviously the right thing. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But like at the end of the day, you still lay in your head like, but well, shit, dude, like, I mean, I can't, I I mean, what we really need to do, you know what I'm saying? Like you say, what you really need to do is close them all. Yeah. But you're like, but fuck, like, I, I don't have the, I mean, this is the best I could do. You know what I'm saying? It's just like, I understand so much more now at this stage in my life and my career and my parenting, like all of those nuances, you know? Yeah. I just wish I could just rap about it. I wish I could just rap about it and do podcasts. You know what I'm saying? Well, like, yeah. I mean, you do. I, I, you do have a podcast. I, I do mean, have a podcast, and yeah. I do talk about the shit. You know, mm-hmm. yeah, um, man. yo, this. Yeah, is a, this I, is I a wish I show, had bro. some cathartic way to deal with it. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, rapping sounds actually extremely cathartic. Um, it really is, bro. But I still think I think I said that when the first time I was on the show. Like, yo, let me write a rap for you, man. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I hear your rhythm I mean, though. I don't know your rhythm. Like, if you have, if I could write it, but if you ain't got rhythm, like, I don't oh, know. no, absolutely not. Okay. Um, yeah, that's that that, that 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 that'll always just be something I have to admire from afar. Um, <laughs> but I I don't know. What do you? You got anything to plug, prop? Know, it, at it, the it, end, at the end of this very bleak day of talking about child prisons, I personally prisons. think that prop should write that for you, and then we should perform it at the live show. Okay, <laughs> I, think it, I do have something to plug. Well, and it's, it's I'm happy with prop show. performing at the live show. No, I, I don't want think any, you to perform it. No, at the live that's show. that's not what they're paying for. Bro, so I bet you right now, if I were to throw on, because you mentioned it already on our show, if I'd throw on like a most def, like a black on both sides record, mm-hmm. put it, you could probably rap along. I yeah. Bet yeah. There are songs out there, some Dessa, some yeah. of the, like the Doom Tree stuff. Yeah, I bet you stuff. I could throw on a full few of them tracks, few of them atmosphere songs. <laughs> yeah, I already know that you could probably <laughs> rap along. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I'm, I may have listened to an Aesop rock or two in my time. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and that's some, and, and listen, that's some complex rapping. Like mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? That ain't that ain't some easy. That ain't some that ain't some easy bars. Like that's some complex rapping. Well, anyway, yes. Oh Propitpot.com. We'll see and, how drunk I get during the live stream. But that's one more reason to check out the live stream. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and hit hit me on Twitter. I'm trying to come up with a game for us to play during the live stream that might involve how drunk Robert what are the, gets. <laughs> I feel like Rock. all the ones are like the boy howdies and like the Hitler calls. I'll be like, man, luckily nobody calls me out on my like, you know what I'm saying? Because I, I feel like you wasted, wasted yes. immediately. Mm-hmm. First 10 <laughs> minutes. Yeah, bro. Funny. Anyways. Yeah. Profitpop.com. I got some new coffee content coming out. Dope. Like got some, uh, got some, uh, you know, music and hood politics pod, man. We're getting got renewed. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. Zone. So there's yeah. more shows coming. You know what I'm saying? Hell yeah. Yeah, so we'll um, be up in yeah. there. Check it out. Check out Prop. Check out Prop's book. Uh, Terraform. Get, check out yeah, our, check, check out Prop's come book. check us out for our live Terraform. stream on. Uh, check out our live stream on February seventeenth. Momenthouse.com slash behind the bastard. Yeah, check that out. And uh, also, uh, I have a fiction book that is on pre-sale right now. If you order during the pre-sale for the next couple of months, you will get a signed copy when it comes out in May. Uh, Google AK Press After the Revolution, and that's where my book will be. AK Press After the Revolution, buy a copy of my novel. You can um, learn about uh, Skullfucker Mike. Skullfucker Mike! <laughs> All right. <laughs> Yo, that's a great book, man. You're Thank like you. fiction's hard to write. It really is. Oh, boy, one howdy, think, it is. Boy, howdy. It's real one pain would think in the that ass. you're like, well, I'm making up a story. Like we've been mm-hmm. making up stories since we've been sneaking out in front of our parents. Like we've been making up stories, but like it's really hard. So like, yo, kudos it's to you. Way bro. easier to just be a judge. Apparently, <laughs> <laughs> you can make money, send kids to jail. Mm-hmm. Great. Boy, mm-hmm. howdy. All right, boy, howdy, indeed. I am Texan. All right, that's the episode. Bam!